This episode of The Meat House is brought to you by Amoretti, the ultimate manufacturer of brewers' natural infusions, craft purees, and concentrates to bring your next batch to the next level. Click on the link in the episode description below to see their full lineup of flavors. Use promo code MEATHOUSE at checkout to save 15% off your next order. Well... I don't know about you guys, but I have had turkey fried, I've had it baked, I've had it roasted, I've had turkey soup, I've had turkey sandwiches, for crying out loud, I had turkey omelets the morning after. So, uh, I'm done with turkey, I don't know about you guys, what do you think? Oh, I, I threw in a little ham there for the weekend. <laughs> Well, hey. Uh, well, I gotta say, I've got a, I've got a trick for turkey. It's a brilliant <laughs> trick. Try to treat it like it ain't turkey. There you go. <laughs> hey, yeah, uh, turkey well, hash anywhere you wouldn't usually use it. Yeah. Wait, well, welcome to the Mead House. Uh, we're live again, back in a saddle on Tuesday night here, and uh, we do have a special guest with us tonight. I think you're gonna have a lot of fun here. Uh, uh, we get things rolling here in just a little bit. But first off, uh, we're all back here. Uh, Ryan uh, Richardson in the house. Aaron Martin along for the ride. Mississippi, Chris Spencer. Uh, he's sitting tight here with us. And Jeff Schaus is in the house. My name is J.D. Webb. Usually uh, we start this show off on, uh, you know, what we're all kind of drinking tonight. And since, and I got to tell you, I got this box. My wife and I came home. Uh, I gotta stop this damn music. Um, I, uh, my wife and I were out and I came home and here's this box sitting by the front door. I'm thinking, what the hell is this? Uh, and uh, it said Grow and Fell Meadery. Of course, I didn't put two and two together. I had no idea what, uh, uh, you know, what, uh, what this was from. And so I blasted out an email to all the guys on the show saying, you know, whoever it was, gee, thanks. <laughs> I had no idea. And, uh, of course, Ryan, uh, I think it was Ryan, might have emailed me back or something. So, yeah, that's uh, from uh, from uh, the, the guys down at uh, Gronfeld Meadery. And I thought, oh, that's right. <laughs> well, J.D., to be fair, the, the first part of your email said, I don't know who sent it, but if it was a mistake, I ain't sending it back. Yeah. <laughs> so, but hey, uh, it was uh, and it was kind of an expected, unexpected uh, gift. But uh, gosh, we need to uh, uh, thank uh, Gronfell Meadery for sending that box out. I'm going to start it off tonight, guys. I had um, uh, I had the uh, I can't remember the name of it now. Uh, Chris, what was it that hopped up? Start describing it. I can I can explain it to you. So, <laughs> I, I had. Give me a description. We uh, okay. I had the, you had the the one that had, had the, the hops bee. in it. There you go. The bitter bee. Yeah. That's what. That would yeah. be bitter bee. You got it. See, someone else got it. And they don't even make it. That's uh, that's good stuff. I like that. Um, I found that to be quite like pleasing. Uh, tonight I've got two of them sitting on my desk and I just popped open the, uh, the chaos sizer, uh, and, uh, mm-hmm. thought we'd give that a try. And, uh, well, boy, I have one too. of those in my yeah. kitchen here in Vermont. Wow. Very, very kind of light. Uh, boy, I get that <laughs> apple flavor. Uh, Mississippi. It's only, it's only 10% apple. Wow. Mississippi, you gotta you gotta yeah. try this one, man. Uh, if you haven't already, but uh, wow, this is really good. Um, and I've got this um, I've got this other farmhouse uh, Nordic farmhouse made. I think that's a cranberry thing, if, if I'm not mistaken. Scandinavian. He, uh, he is actually. Yeah, with cranberries. But uh, uh, Jeff, what are you drinking tonight? Um, tonight I am, uh, I'm drinking the Old Wayfarer, the Oak Aged Amber Mead, and, uh, I'm going to back that up with the Valkyrie's Choice, actually. Wow. And Ryan, uh, what's in your glass, bud? 
I'm drinking the Valkyrie's Choice myself. This is, uh, it's really something special when you consider how simple it it is. I mean, the can says, you know, honey, yeast, water, sulfites, uh, but this is dry. It's got some effervescence. It's, it's got a lot of flavor. Um, you know, we haven't even introduced our guest yet, but I can't wait to start talking about some of this stuff here in a minute. <laughs> Um, I'll, uh, I'll tell you though, what I had, uh, the other one I had was the, the chocolate, the chocolate pepper mead. Um, and, and I can't wait to talk about that one too, cause that, that is such an interesting, um, an interesting mead. And I, I just love to, love to talk, you know, get into it and get in, uh, those proportions and, and what we're getting out of it. Yeah. And uh, Mississippi, uh, which one did you crack open? I've got the Sour Cherry um, Psycho Pump. The uh, the Fire Drake is gone. The Ginger is gone. <laughs> the Chaos Sizer is gone. <laughs> uh, so we're we're getting low. <laughs> we need another box. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. Then uh, let's see. Did I hit everybody? Uh, Ricky, are you drinking anything tonight? I am. I'm treating myself to a Manhattan. I've had a very there. long day. <laughs> there you go. Is it made with mead? I woke up in Vermont. I was going to say, I do. I actually do a mead Manhattan. Uh, there'll be mead in it in a moment. Yeah. Aaron, did I skip over you? I think you did. Uh, no worries. What are you drinking? I, well, first, I just have to laugh at your story about coming home and seeing an unexpected box out there. We were out of town, and the same exact thing happened to me. <laughs> uh, so um, I, you guys are much further along with these than I am. We just got home on, on Sunday a couple days ago. Um, so I'm cracking open the first one tonight, the, the Bitter Bee, the Hopped Mead. Oh, wow. I and like just that one. one. Yeah, it, I'm enjoying it. I also just have to say I love the cans. I think that's a really cool way to package it. Yeah. Well, you can't I, sell bottles to save your life in Vermont anymore. Really? Is that, yep, 16-ounce uh, cans are nothing. We actually discontinued all of our bottles. Wow. Uh, that some, must be some kind of a state law or something i guess huh no 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 it's uh it's just everyone's into the cans these days i think it's a hip thing yeah <laughs> that's i wouldn't uh, know i ain't particularly hip all right well <laughs> yeah, we uh we've got a lot to talk about here tonight uh of course uh ricky the mead maker i don't know if you've uh, you know and i i just recently uh after uh the email and everything uh with ryan here uh, over the last couple of days had to go to YouTube and watch the videos. I had never seen them before. And, uh, dude, I'm telling, I'll tell you what, you, you need a Grammy award or something. Uh, some of the funniest things that, that I think I've ever seen. And, but you're delivering the message out there to, to meat makers, uh, in such a humorous way. I mean, it's amazing. Uh, it's good stuff and very, very entertaining. What really, what I, I tell my Grammy all the time, and just turned 92, she watches my show, and she'll, like, notice that 300 other people have watched an episode. And she asks every time, who on earth watches your show that isn't related to you? <laughs> and I have to tell her, I don't know, Grammy. Like, but recently, um, I've been given, like, a regular spot on our local news. Just oh, wow. because, and and when they offered me the spot, I said, talking about what? I can't imagine people at 6 a.m. are going to want to hear about mead every week. I don't even know why people on YouTube watch it. And they were like, oh, just come on and talk about whatever. Well, so, you know, that's, that's kind of how we... I mean, that's what I do on Michelle. Yeah, and that's, uh, you know, I mean, that's kind of how we started out, too. Uh, you know, it was, uh, I produced a show, uh, another show, quite a while back. Uh, all about mead and uh, since left and then Chris uh, Chris Spencer Mississippi uh, he and I kind of get together and uh, we decided to launch a new show and then uh, we found Aaron and and Jeff and and Ryan uh, came aboard and uh, you know we're just uh, we're just five guys sitting around the table none of us are professional mead makers 
were just you know avid home brewers home meat makers and uh you know we we come in we talk about uh you know what we got going or we'll pick out a recipe and either tear it apart and fix it or uh, come up with a recipe and uh, and do it uh, we've got a couple of projects that we've had in the fermenter already i think we're yeah, we might be working on our third or fourth by now i guess uh this braggot thing that uh, i had a i do i I have a favor for you guys at some point in the course of the evening that I need to ask of you. So sure. when there's a lull, you let me know. Yeah, we'll do. I, man, I, I, I dig this chaos. Uh, Chris, what did you think about this sizer? Um, I liked it a lot. I mean, I haven't opened anything yet that I didn't like. And, uh, you know, um, I was making good meat, and everybody liked what I was making, and my wife liked it. And uh, then this box shows up, and uh, <laughs> now everybody's saying this is how you should be making your meat. And uh, so uh, I don't know. My I guess you know why'd you ruin my life, Ricky? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, oh, well, the, the, the good this, news is so the easy part is making good meat. The tough thing, and you can do it at home, is I was going to tell you guys when you were talking about the Valkyrie's Choice, that particular can you have is, let's see, ship time, five weeks old, as in it was honey five weeks ago. Jeez. Holy wow. moly. Yeah. Wow. I mean, this stuff is good. That's you the know, tough uh, part. I've got to say, though, so far my favorite has been the uh, the chili chocolate mead and it's not because of the chilies or the chocolate it's because that particular mead had more honey character in the flavor in the aroma in everything mm-hmm. than, than the others have you tried old wayfarer yet not yet uh that's the one old that's way coming up later tonight. <clears throat> okay old wayfarer uh it's it we can get into all the nerdy details because when i'm at my bar people will walk up and you know, they'll they'll ask me a question. I'll look right at them and go, now, are you a home brewer or are you just curious? Because I've got two completely different versions of the story. If you're <laughs> willing to listen to me talk for 35 minutes, I will tell you exactly why the one with chilies in it tastes more like honey than the one that, that has twice as much honey, but it's Valkyrie's choice. But most people just go, nope, actually don't care. Pour me another sample. Yeah, pour me another sample. Uh, we're we're me. Yeah, we do free here, samples. So you so. feel free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll you are. Yeah. Well, while we're on fire, Drake. Um, you know, I wanted to. That was the first one that I tried, and and it was actually the first one I tried because when I got the cans, I thought it was the one that I'd like the least. Uh, I'm not a, I'm mm-hmm. not a, I'm not a pepper guy, you know, a spiciness, that kind of thing. And, and I was with my brother and, and we opened it and, uh, shared it. And I, I figured if I didn't like it, I just tell him to drink it. Um, it was, I wish I told these guys, I, I said, I, it was not at all what I expected because I personally mm-hmm. didn't get any heat. I didn't get any heat. Mm-hmm. And, and I, and I, like Chris, uh, was saying, I got a lot of honey flavor and aroma out of it. And then, um, I wasn't sure what the cocoa was doing in it. So I'd, I'd love if you could just, just tell us a little bit about that one and, and what the cocoa does for it. The, the cocoa so, hit me are you after allowed? I finished the glass. Uh, uh-huh. when I was drinking so, it, I didn't get cocoa. That's an important <laughs> question. I was going to say, am I allowed to cuss on your show? Um, I'm not going to. I'm not going to cuss much. I never cuss on my own show. Yeah. The reason I bring it up is. Go ahead. I'll keep it clean. Don't you worry. Um. So when so Kelly, uh, who you've seen on a couple episodes of Ask Mead Maker, she owns Grunfell Meadery and Ed Havoc Mead. And she and I are pretty routinely asked to be celebrity judges for beer and meads and from time to time wines and ciders as well. 
which means that over the years, I've had probably a hundred beers, wines, meads, and ciders with peppers in them. Yeah. And what I've thought to myself every single time I've had one is, you know, this ain't bad. The only thing that would make it better, no goddamn peppers. <laughs> <laughs> because people will make this like, yeah. right? Like people make this really solid porter, and you're like, you know what? The habanero wasn't terrible. It's usually the best you can muster. Like, that would have been a good beer, but it was an okay beer, given that there were peppers in it. And mm -hmm. so, honey is unusual in that honey is used in a lot of, like, Thai recipes, right? And mm -hmm. there are spicy things. And up here in New England, we do a lot of, like, spiced maple syrup. You know, chili-infused maple syrup. So, I'm unusual as a brewer for a variety of reasons. One, you know, I'm Ricky the Mead Maker. Two, I also have a background in cooking. Um, so, I'm the chef of our restaurant as well, which is a total pain, um, doing wearing both hats. But I've just pulled on sort of a dream team to help me in the kitchen. Um, but what I did was, I didn't want heat. I didn't want this to be that beer with the jalapeno at the bottom that you dare your friends to drink. Both companies, Grunfell and Havoc, have what we call the two-pint requirement. Every single thing we make has to be enjoyable for two pints. Good. So you can't have something that's such a hop bomb that it just wrecks your palate and it's no fun. And with the heat, I didn't want it. So if you chug a pint of it, the heat, you'll feel it. But it dissipates really quickly. And what I did was I actually took my old mole recipe uh, from when I used to be allowed to cook mole. We make all Viking food now um, at our restaurant. So mole is very much out. But yeah. I took my chocolate pepper sauce recipe. And so Fire Drake and Old Wayfarer are our only needs that don't use uh, the honey we get direct from our farmer a few hours away. We get this crazy, crazy, like, dark brown honey from South America and Venezuela. It's blended for us. And the stuff's almost inedible in honey form. It really? almost tastes wow. like molasses. Yep. So what I did was, the reason the cocoa's in there is to emphasize the honey. Okay. You in, we have one other product that when people go, I can't really taste, you know, that like the lemon in root of all evil. Those people can't taste the lemon. And what I tell them is my goal is you would only notice if it weren't there. Yeah, so the chocolate is in there to emphasize that's actually the reason part of what you're smelling when you crack open that can and, oh, my God, do you smell those honey, honey aromas? It's that there are a couple aldehydes that are in cocoa that are also in honey, so they sort of emphasize each other. You sound like you have. Uh, you sound like you've incorporated your your cooking background into your mead bag making because you know I'm in all the cooking show. I'm I'm an amateur cook too, and I I love to cook. Uh, and I've seen all the cooking shows, and I've seen them add ingredients to things. Not to highlight a specific flavor, but to kind of ramp it up a little bit. And you wouldn't notice it, like yep. you say, unless it was missing. So, just, so I'll uh, give you uh, the weirdest example. Recently, we have someone on our staff who's pregnant, and she like doesn't want everyone to know yet. Luckily, we now have enough people on our staff that that's not giving anything away. Um, so like I've been making non-alcoholic mold drinks. and recently. All these people were really enjoying the cider I made, and I had actually put strawberry juice in it. And it made no sense, but it didn't taste like strawberries. The strawberries just counteracted the fact that I had thrown a whole bunch of mulling spices in there, but no booze to cut into them. Yeah. So, wow. Interesting. The tricks of the trade. <clears throat> yeah, there are a lot of the same reason how I use a half a banana 
or a vanilla bean sometimes, not to get a banana flavor or a vanilla flavor, but, you know, to to increase body or mouthfeel or something. And if you, like you said, if it wasn't there, you would know it. Uh, you got it. I mean, that's the whole idea behind hot fermentations, right? You know? drive up those flavors and and you get your clove and your banana and your vanilla and it just makes a more interesting final beverage you um let's let's uh let's switch over to the sizer here for a minute uh at the top of the show you said something about this is only 10 percent apple juice or apple or whatever isn't that crazy uh-huh yeah. how do you 10% uh, not even 10 percent of volume how do you get to okay? How do you get to this point with this sizer? Because this is like the perfect. This is exactly what I'm looking for uh, in a cider, in a sizer. I'm not looking for a Martinelli sweet apple juice. Uh, I'm looking yeah. for this. This is this is light, refreshing, uh, unbelievably good. So we are a full open source company. Uh, every one of my recipes is freely available um, for other professionals. I even give you know contact information for my sourcing. Um, I'm, you guys couldn't get it, so I don't mind telling you. Um, <laughs> and I frankly don't mind if anyone figures it out. But uh, we, um, I have a really close friend in our industry. He owns a cider company up here. And they're just blowing up. Absolutely. You know, they're in like seven states all of a sudden and high reviews. And when I was developing this recipe, I was like, hey, man, uh, looking for a good source for cider apples. Who should I use? And he looks right at me and goes, no one in Vermont and no one in New York. And I go, okay, heard. Because last year, the United States sold something like 110% of its cider apples. Basically, we're not even close to keeping up with the demand. So I wrote to a guy who gets me my really weird ingredients. His name is Larry, which is like the perfect name for a guy that can get you anything. <laughs> anything. And uh, Larry found that in central Spain, like the Basque region, they used to have a huge cider industry, but all of a sudden, Spanish wines are really popular in Europe because of the way the euro works. So they can get, like, really cheap, really good Spanish wines, and all these people are basically letting their cider apples go fallow. So um, I could get actual fast cider apples in the United States because no one in Europe was using them. So the trick was just getting a really high-quality apple juice and then backing it up with the right... So our uh, wildflower honey has a pretty apple flavor to begin with. And then, just like you were saying, whichever one of you was saying it, we throw vanilla in there. Not so it's a vanilla mead, but so that it emphasizes both the apple and the honey. Okay. This is... Uh, this is... This is... I, I think this is where I want to be with my own meads. This is this is exactly what I'm looking for. Uh, even the first one that I had. I'm glad. Uh, well, yeah, I, I, I've got to say this, and, and all these guys know already that, that I'm not a dry mead person at all. Uh, but I, I drink this stuff all day if I could. Uh, How long have I been telling you guys about dry session meads? Was that Ryan? Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Say it again, Ryan. So how long have I been telling you guys about dry session meads? I know. (laughs) Yeah. Well, the bubbles, guys, the bubbles make all the difference. You know, and... I I actually don't love dry still meads myself. Uh, so I do, we do have a special in-house only line of honey wines. Um, we will almost certainly never, ever release them to the public. I'm not going to burden my poor distributor with trying to sell honey wine, but we have one dry one there. That's pretty popular. 
And I don't, I don't particularly care for, and these guys have heard me say it too. I, I don't particularly care for carbonated drinks other than my beer. And, mm-hmm. uh, it's only been very recently that I've, uh, you know, yours is probably the second one that I've had. My, actually, I think my first one, Aaron, was your Braggot. Uh, mm-hmm. I believe that was a, probably the first carbonated mead that I had. Uh, that I really enjoyed. You had enjoyed. Frank Goldbeck's. You had well, Frank Goldbeck's mead. Yeah, um, but that, that's. Hey, you guys had. I was, was going to say, you bit, guys had anything uh, from Charm City yet? I had no. Charms. I actually had Charm City's pumpkin mead on, uh, you know, oh, last weekend. I mean, oh. I haven't had that one, but I think they're another company that's just. Filling it with the bubbles. Their canned yeah. meads are. I mean, I'd be happy to buy them off the shelf if they were available in my area. Well, is I mean, this, hell, I, got, uh, I got a fridge full of their stuff from when I went to Maryland. You know, for a long time, Ricky, I've been I've been thinking that mead should be treated like a wine and not carbonated, but left still, left to age. Uh, you know, and perhaps maybe that's what I was looking for. But maybe I've been mistaken all along. Maybe uh, maybe that's not what I should be doing because uh, the two that I've had from you so far, I mean, this is it. This is what I need to probably base all of my meads off of right here because this is – it's not sweet. It's lightly carbonated. It's not over the top. I get the apple, uh, you know, a uh, slight apple taste. It leaves you wanting more. I mean, I'm going to finish this can. I wish I had another uh, before the night is done. Yep. I actually always feel guilty uh, when I send uh, people just one of each. Well, making... Well, you uh, can fix that. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> Perpetual Once I'm allowed to sell out of state, you guys can have as much of my meat as you want. What, uh, uh, you know, when, when you talk 10% apples, is this, is that... Uh, during fermentation, do you use secondary? How do you treat the apple? No, uh, that, that's primary. Every every single fruit uh, in both both lines, Granville and Havoc, um, every single fruit is primary. Um, with a, a, I mean, technical exception, um, root of all evil has lemon in it, which is technically a fruit, and it's added in secondary. Uh, though we recently had an issue with that with um, re-fermentation. It serves me right. Um, learned my lesson. Ten years, ten years of brewing, and I'd never had re-fermentation, and we are halfway through opening 9,000 cans and pouring them back into a fermenter. Oh, uh, it's wow. a shit show. Wow. Sorry, they were swearing again. <laughs> it was, yeah. But you know what? It's been a good day. Uh, we, have a, we have a new hire. He was one of our regulars. He used to work at a brewery, and on his first day, he got to stand with rubber gloves on and very carefully pour uh, 4,236 cans into a fermenter. Oh, so, oh. Welcome aboard, DJ. <laughs> yeah. He's pay, paying his dues. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yep. If we, we uh, really, uh, I'll tell you, we, go ahead. I was going to mean no, to cut no, no, off no. your story, Ricky. I'm, uh, I just can't get over this Valkyrie's choice that I'm drinking here. This is, uh, <laughs> It, I want to talk, actually, the Valkyrie's Choice is the one I want to talk about, because... Yeah, um, I would love for you to I'm talk sorry about that you... Okay. Go ahead, So, one of the things we talk about is, as I said, open source company. Um, frankly, if, some, if, if local people want to buy from my honey supply, I will sell to them portions of my drop. You know, like, I want people at home making mead, because you know what? Home brewing did not make a dent in craft beer's sales. And one of the things I found over the last couple of years, I had these, uh, I call them kids, they're, you know, like 23, 24, um, who came in to the mead hall about two weeks ago, and one of them, they had all gone to the college that uh, is next to our mead hall, and one of them tried to make Valkyrie's choice at home. And he was like, man, it was so good. I almost nailed it. And his two friends were just, like, standing behind him, shaking their heads. 
And he, he could tell, and he turns around, he's like, well, I thought it was good. And they were like, <laughs> it was good, but, you know, one of the things I want people to understand is anybody can make incredible meat at home. I have had mead from home brewers better than anything I put in a can. Like, part of my goal as a professional brewer is to be as good as the one-off batches of home brewers consistently. Valkyrie's Choice is the mead that I hand to home brewers, and I say, you'll appreciate that. Wow. Because well, you know, is, Ricky, we've talked about uh, before on the show that we could, we could take a recipe and we could hand it around to all of us and go home and make it, and, and we could follow it to the letter, but they would all taste different because we've got different honey, different water, different fermentation mm-hmm. uh, conditions, everything, no matter how yep, hard and we, we try, we would never replicate uh-huh. between And when you think about the fact that up where I am, uh, we switch aquifers throughout the year in Vermont. So during the summer, my water comes from one, like it comes from a river, and part of the year comes off a lake, and part of the, you know, that's being a professional, easily the hardest challenge is creating this thing that batch to batch, nobody complains. And, you know, we get these things that crack us up at the meat hall where, you know, we'll pour something, people will go, oh my God, I like this batch so much better than the last one when it's the exact same batch. You know, it's just, the palate changed that day. It's warmer outside, so they like this beverage better or whatever. But Valkyrie's Choice, my final hydrometer reading on it is 0.996. The actual density of ethanol versus the density of H2O comes into play. Like, that's how dry it is. And I still have people, probably twice a month, slam a glass down and go, too sweet for me. (laughs) Too sweet. Because they're Mm. getting all this flavor and aroma out of it, uh, especially on draft. I mean, it's the one thing you can't quite capture in a can, and I don't know why. But, like, every, especially, like, two days after fermentation, you know, completes and we get it in the keg, you could, it, it smells like warm honey when you pour it out of the glass, you know, the tap. Wow. Um, but, it, so I mean, it's... let's talk about yeast. Uh, let's talk about yeast selection. Let's talk about, and that's exactly day. what I was going to say. It's D47 in there, guys. <laughs> okay. so for three years i maintained a house strain um three years i had a house strain and then finally uh we had a a 850 gallon batch fail to complete and i went through all this rigmarole i used i used rescue then i pitched another yeast strain to try to dry it out and then I took a reading, and it still was at 10.08, and then I just, like, set it to chill, cried a little bit, moved on to another batch, and that one completed, and I, and I measured it, and it was 10.08, and then I went and I checked. Um, we have basically um, Minaz, which is only in glass, so we don't ship it. Um, Minaz is, like the uh, absolute zero of meat. Like, if you need to standardize against something, we use Minaz in-house. I dropped my hydrometer into a glass that I had degassed. It was 10.08. The paper in my hydrometer had shifted. The first batch had not failed. We had 860 gallons of a perfectly good mead sitting in a tank for three months because I thought, that it had failed to complete fermentation. Waiting for it to finish. Through this... uh Uh-huh, uh-huh. So as I told you, we're three-week turnaround, usually. And so this was like a crisis. Three weeks? In this process... Yeah, honey to glass in three weeks. Okay, I I need to stop you right there. one time. I I need to stop you right there. For... Mm -hmm. how, how, How does a home mead maker get it from pitch to bottle in three weeks? Or is, is it even possible? I'm going to, I promise to tell you. 
This is the lead into that. This is my great gift to the home brewer because when I was putting together my business prospectus and my pitch, basically I was told by one of my investors that if I couldn't get my turnaround under four weeks, it was going to cost me $150,000. And so I was like, okay, let's figure this out. So we'll get to exactly what I do because I now have a lot of customers who have started brewing, which I think is great, though two of them used to come in every Friday, and I now see them like once every three months. So that thing I said earlier about how mead makers not taking a chunk out of professional mead making may not be true in this particular case. Um, but in this whole process where I thought I had lost the batch, I had this crisis of faith. I had started with a liquid strain. I had carefully cultivated this thing up. I'd actually made a, a variety of yeast, um, through progressive mutation that could ferment lemon juice. Um, and the people at Y yeast laboratories wanted to sequence my house strain for the pH tolerance, which is cool except I thought I had lost the batch. And so in this moment, just like, like everyone during a crisis, right, you go back to the faith of your youth. You know, a lot of people who were atheists went back to Catholic churches the week after September 11th. Like, you go back <laughs> to your childhood faith, and I, was, and I bought $300 worth of D47 because, like, that was, that was my workhorse as a home brewer. And I pitched it into a batch, and I can't remember where it was. I, I wouldn't know because I'm not allowed to look at my reviews on Untapped or anywhere like that. Um, I try to emphasize, like, I'm just the pretty face of this company. Like, Kelly owns it. Jamie makes sure things actually get where they need to go. Like, we're proud of the fact that we're a woman-owned, woman-operated brew house. But, like, I can't emphasize that enough. Like, with I'm, I'm really just the pretty face and the brewer. But... I threw in this D47, and all of a sudden, our reviews on Valkyrie's Choice, which was already our most popular product, start picking up. Mm-hmm. And I was like, if I don't have to keg up and wash $1,000 worth of yeast every three weeks, and I can just buy $80 worth of commercial yeast and pour it in through a little hole at the top of my fermenter, I'm going to do that. Yeah. So Valkyrie's choice is, if you want to make it at home, Canadian wildflower honey, which you can get, E47 yeast, six times more than you usually pitch, Y yeast, wait, 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 nutrient wait. blend. Wait, wait, wait. Six times more than you usually pitch. <clears throat> We're going to get back to that in a second because I promised I'd be good. <laughs> Other okay. professional mead makers, this, I was going to give you very usable things. <laughs> also, guys, this, I think I'm, I think this I'm the might cover be a story with the next show. Your own magazine. <laughs> this oh, this might be a no, it won't. I go to bed at 10. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm already up pad out now. Um, <laughs> well, he's ca- you're coming uh, on a second so, show. The good news I is, <laughs> so okay. the good news is um, I, just, I just heard, I think I'm the cover story of the next Brew Your Own magazine. I'm pretty certain I'm the first cover mead story. So I do this whole thing about how we do what we do, the three-week turnaround, because that's what I gave my my lecture on at um, HomebrewCon this year. So basically, back to what I said. I kill the wild yeast in my honey because I use raw honey. Um, And we're going to talk, who still has a Nordic farmhouse? Uh, I I still have one. Yeah. It's in the pantry. I haven't. I've okay. got it sitting on my desk. We're, I haven't popped the top on it yet. I'm still loving this. Good. Side. I, w- I want to talk to people while we're drinking it because it's a full wild fermentation. Ah. Uh, so. Oh. Yeah. So with Valkyrie's choice, I kill the wild yeast. Tons of Y yeast, yeast, yeast nutrient. Unlike like the Fermate K and DAP. You really can't use too much of the Y yeast yeast nutrient because it just falls out of solution what it, the yeast doesn't need. 
I mean, it, it, it's minerals, basically. Um, a lot of that robustness, you're getting the mouthfeel, even though it's that dry, that's all thanks to Y yeast. Those wow. guys and their yeast nutrient give such body to your meads. And then I ferment it hotter than anybody says you should ferment it. How do you mean? I ferment, ferment it hot. As in Valkyrie's Choice, that baby cooks at 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, my God. Holy cow. Wow. That's 20, belie- it, that's 20 uh, degrees uh, above where I ferment. With D47, uh-huh. too. So it, all those that, things. Uh, uh-huh. How does it yeah. not come out hot? Are you guys ready? Do you have your notepads out? Oh, yeah. Type Are you ready? Plan. I'm going to walk you through, step by step, every single part of my rationale. And um, you're free to tear it apart. You could have like a whole episode next week where you're like, what the hell was that guy talking about? That's fine. Um, I will tell you one thing I have going for me, uh, other than the fact that I'm like selling mead and able to, I I mean, I own a 215-year-old manor home in Vermont. So like that's weird um, for mead makers. But (laughs) I have a... uh, uh, pharmaceutical company next door to me and they're able to tell me things about what I make that I don't quite understand even with all the chemistry I've studied. So that helps. So, are you guys ready? Yeah. We're ready. Number one, raw honey makes all the difference in the world. You can make a good, a very good mead with Costco honey. I've made lots of very good mead with a Costco honey. What it is difficult to make is a good dry mead because the volatile flavonoids and other compounds are driven off through the pasteurization process. Mm-hmm. What about the Costco so raw honey? Get raw, raw honey has one more added benefit, and that is that pollen is a yeast nutrient. We don't know why. We don't know what in pollen functions as a yeast nutrient, but bless the hearts of the American Honey Society, they have run side-by-side tests at, like, the university of somewhere, and it's been found fairly robustly that pollen, grade A yeast nutrient. Next. You can actually use distilled water to make mead. So long as you are prepared to ameliorate, ameliorate, not ameliorate, ameliorate the water with minerals. We actually build up the mineral components of our mead by hand. After sending our water through a multi-stage filter. Why yeast nutrient blend is basically the way we do that. I use, I just worked this out for the article, uh, the Brew Your Own article, so like you'll be able to go there and check if I'm wrong about any of these numbers, but I think I figured out that we use something like a whopping one ounce of nutrients per gallon. Wow. Wow. We don't truck with this step nutrient addition nonsense. That completely misses the metabolic life of yeast. Next, (laughs) D47 is so cheap. Like, even if if I were paying your prices for D47 and not commercial brewer prices, it's still a bargain at any price. I think but I'm paying 89 for, cents a sachet. Yeah. Right, right, right. 89 yeah. cents. That's the cheapest thing in your entire brew. If you're not using a packet per gallon, you're wasting your money. This packet stuff is incredible. Side Why? note. Okay. Right. Well, I was going to say, why no, why I'm... so much yeast? Uh, 
a packet per gallon. I mean, that's like five packets for a five-gallon batch. That's exactly five packets for a five-gallon batch. Your math is extraordinary. Um, how many people here on just, the show make beer also? Yes. I, I do. Yep. 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 Several as of, of us. As of a month Several ago, us. yes. Okay. <laughs> Pretty much all of us, yeah. I think. Most yeah. of so, us, yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. So when you are done a batch of beer, how many inches of troop do you have at the bottom of that bucket? A lot. <laughs> yeah. Three, three, four inches? Yeah. yeah. Yep. And every every beer brewer bitches about how much beer they lose to the troube and yeast at the bottom. How much yeah. yeast do you have left at the end of a batch of meat? Yeah. Sixteenth sure, like of that. How much troube <laughs> yeah. is at the bottom? Yeah, Not about much. a sixteenth uh-huh. of that. Yeah. Uh-huh. You literally have 15 time more yeast fermenting a batch of beer than you do a batch of mead because of the propagation of that yeast in its initial life cycle in your batch. Okay. You're not over-pitching when you put okay. five packets in. According to why yeast pitch recommendations, at five packets in a five-gallon batch, you're still under-pitching. You know, that's interesting because now that I think about it, you know, the beer that I brewed, you're right, and yet I've added zero nutrients to any of the beers that I've brewed. Zero. You know how well humans do in a pure sugar environment? About as well as yeast does. Wow. Yeast does not like a pure sugar environment, and that's is what meat is. It's sugar and water. I mean, you might as well be making jungle juice if yeah. you're not back adding minerals. Interesting. Wow. So, yep, you can't... I mean, this is what I tell my my customers who are homebrewers. You can't overpitch. Okay, so... You can so, break the bank on you. So, Ricky, I'm going to just kind of run down what I've, what I've heard here. So we're gonna start mm-hmm. with we're gonna start with uh, raw honey, and then and distilled water, distilled water, and uh, mm, the, no, the no 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 don't use distilled water. You can. Oh, okay. So we're gonna. I use... would recommend using use your local water and then add more minerals. I was just yeah. emphasizing that if you are building up your minerals. You could theoretically start with distilled, but I wouldn't. Okay, so so we're going to use especially as a home brewer, just use, use tap water. A, use a tap water. If your tap water. water is good to drink, it's good to brew. Yep. Okay, so we're using our tap water. Using uh, one ounce, let's just say one ounce of the Y yeast nutrient per gallon. Is that the right proportion you had said? If that's your thing. Okay. Yep. If and you then, are not a Y yeast kind of guy, if you're not a Y yeast kind of guy. I would say experiment because you can definitely overdo with Fermi's K. Anything that's really high nitrogen, you will taste. I'm this is not I'm not a shill for why you to nutrient. So if Jeez. there's something else you want to play with, one of my friends who's a distiller uses all Fermi's K. Isn't that so what Mississippi has been use telling? The kind of levels I do? Mississippi yep. so tells why me the is same lovely thing. because it's what we use. Yep. Yeah. So then yeah, and uh, and so uh, the the uh, the nutrient all goes in up front, right? Right. Why waste your time? Why open that bucket more often than necessary? You're just asking for trouble. Okay. So we get it in there. We pitch. We pitch the uh, a lot of yeast. You know. So if we're doing one gallon here, we'll use one full packet. And then you had said that you you ferment at 88 degrees. What is the what is the room temperature of of what you're fermenting, and I guess or how much of that is is the heat generated from that that vigorous fermentation you must get? Let me tell you. So we're I hear someone here named Mississippi. Um, I'm standing in a in a room, a room in a home that's 52 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's only because we just had our fireplace roaring. 
it's going to drop to 46 here overnight inside my house. It's not December yet. My metering, if we miss our marks, because we have no way to heat our fermentation, we can only cool them. Um, if we miss our mark, we're screwed. So, one time, we went a little high because it was the dead of winter. My meat hall uh, was, this is where people sit and eat, by the way, 52 degrees. 52. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so I, it was a little cold. I've insulated fermenters. We ferment, you know, roughly 1,000 gallons at a time. So I got her down to about 80 degrees, pitched the yeast, expecting to lose a few more degrees, and then to have my chiller kick on at 76. 76, still a little high for what some people do with D47, but very much within its temperature range. So I have a, um, so Kelly and I uh, both got HVAC certified to install our own cooling system for our fermenters. About mm, 30% of the system had to be installed by professionals because, you know, three-phase wiring and all that. Yeah. In that 30%, there's a tiny, tiny little $95 flow valve that is, after three years of tweaking, Still screwed up. You guys hear there how I didn't use a real curse word that I would usually use about <laughs> this thing of my yeah. existence. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, this little flow valve failed to fire. Shut down our entire system because what it told the system was, oh no, there's a break in the line. Stop the pump. Oh. I got in, and my entire metery smelled, the way I described it later in another interview was like a bunch of Green Bay Packers fans were put on a strict cabbage diet for three weeks and were <laughs> stuffed into a small room. Oh. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I opened the door, and something is so clearly wrong, and I almost start throwing up. Oh, wow. So I run over, restart the chiller, and what had happened was, this was back when we were using our house strain, which was originally built off of the Y-yeast dry need strain. It was putting out so much hydrogen sulfide that to this day, I'm not certain I didn't suffer brain damage. We shut it down. We get the temperature back down. I look at it. It had hit 88 degrees. And here I am in a quiet panic, you know, because I don't want everyone else on the staff to worry. When I say everyone else, at that point, it was two other people. And we get to the end, and we pull a sample off the nickel valve, the, the sample valve. It's undrinkable. You pour it into your glass, and it smells like rotten egg. Mm. And I start you know, panicking. This was not a point in our careers where we could sacrifice a thousand gallon batch, you know? Yeah. I mean, even today, losing a thousand gallons is kind of unacceptable, but it's built into the budget if something should happen. What yeah. I do is, um, I will tell you guys, uh, I would not recommend becoming a, a professional mean maker. I've now gone four years without a paycheck, but. If you do, the nicest thing about it is no one sees you as a threat. I'm a friend to every beer brewer in the state of Vermont. We have more breweries per capita than any other state. And no one's like, oh, my God, those guys at Crenshaw Meadery, they're stealing my sales. They just, like, see me as this adorable guy based in Colchester, serving eight pounds of herring a week and making a beverage nobody knows about. So, because of that, and my affable personality, I like to think, um, I start calling around. I'm like, guys, I'm afraid I'm going to lose this batch. And I call my friend Dan, who's the head brewer for 14th Star Brewery, uh, which is one of the most successful breweries in the state of Vermont. And I was like, this just happened. What do I do? And he goes, well, have you tried CO2 purging? 
Because back in my homebrew days, and this matters, this is where I was going to teach you guys my trick, I used to throw my toe on the edge of a bucket, you know, every few days and be gas. Just shake it back and forth, get the bubbles out, CO2, retards active fermentation, so you get a more vigorous fermentation. You stir the, the yeast up in the solution. You knock those bubbles out. That's the best way to get down to 0.996, final gravity. Yeah. You can't do that when you have 33-barrel tanks. Um, I mean, one of the tanks almost fell over and crushed Kelly, which was the worst moment of my entire life. But it didn't. That would have actually been the worst moment of my entire life. and. You can't just shake these things back and forth. And he said, have you considered CO2 purging? Basically, CO2 is the cheapest thing in all of brewing when you're a pro. I mean, it comes to you on a truck. They plug a thing into the wall, and three weeks later, they're like, your bill for 700 pounds of CO2 is $100, which is great. Or less. I don't even know. I don't pay the bills. I told you I'm the pretty face. So... Basically, what I do is I plug my CO2 into my stone, and I just start sending this gas through. Bubbles up, and the place reeks. We buy a $600 carbon air filter and roll it in line with our bubble lock, basically, to clean the air as it comes out. And everyone else in the facility is still complaining about me. Uh-huh. And then I give them free drinks and they stop complaining. But Interesting. ever since, since we switched back to D47, we haven't had this awful fermentation. It was partially my house strain, which was actually a poly strain. And we won't go into the nuances of that because it's not useful to you guys. But when you make a mead as dry as Valkyrie's Choice, if you ferment it super clean, it'll taste like vaguely honey-flavored seltzer. This is actually what most people are complaining about when they say they don't like dry mead, that they're flavorless. When you ferment hot, you get all sorts of esters and aldehydes and all sorts of cool things that emphasize the honey. They don't detract from it. So long as you have a way to purge it. You guys throw your toe on the edge of your bucket and shake it back and forth. And then when fermentation is done, get a power drill and a wine whip and you beat it out. Yeah. If you have a, a carb stone, just throw your carb stone at the bottom of it and just run CO2 through for a minute. That'll volatize everything in there. Apologize to your spouse uh, for the smell. And then, you know, give him or her a drink, and it'll all be skookum. But that's the biggest thing that I try to drive home to homebrewers because it's the opposite of what you find online. Ferment it cold, ferment it clean. You don't want a clean fermentation. One of my favorite beers is uh, Donko Weiss. The beauty of a Donko Weiss is that it's not a Schwarz beer. It's not a super clean black lager. It has all these flavors going on. Same grains. It's fermented hot. It takes advantage of that yeast. And I hate when I see these things online that they use champagne yeast. Champagne yeast is supposed to do one thing. Strip the flavors and give you alcohol. I mean, I guess technically that's two things. But supposed to take the flavors out. Champagne yeast is is the Teflon bullet of yeast. Yeah, yeah. that's probably why All I don't it's like champagne. to do is make alcohol. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, one, champagne. one champagne to another, they all taste the same to me. Sorry, brute. Sorry, and you know. Unlike people, who, unlike people who say that about beer and whiskey and wine, you're right about champagne. Um I'm going to say something which I think is extremely unlikely, but I'm going to throw it out there. Anybody here a big Dorothy Sayers fan? Yeah, that's the silence I'm usually met with. Um, <laughs> brilliant writer. Brilliant writer. 
But there's a great line in one of her books where someone has just been saved from the gallows. And she says, you know, I guess I'm supposed to order oysters and champagne. And the protagonist of the book goes, yeah, if you're a plebeian, (laughs) champagne is not interesting. There's a reason that everybody likes champagne. It's the same reason that on a hot day, everybody <laughs> likes a Budweiser, even me. Yeah, well, I mean, there's a yeah, there's a reason why there's you know, you know, sixty eight cases of it at a wedding. You know, I mean, it's the cheapest stuff. Uh-huh. You can I mean, it's just you know. But hey, uh, funny story for you guys. I'm like the only, I'm the only pro brewer that I know. Any type of brewing. Uh, who didn't drink till he was legal, which means that I missed out on all those fun things like shotgunning PBR. I had my first PBR last summer, actually. That's amazing. One of blue ribbon, you know. Yeah. So, wow. Ricky, when you when we started the show, you said that uh, you had an ask of us, just bef- so we don't forget I it. Do. So we don't, Thank uh, you. So let's let's yeah. hear it. Because I'm going to go to bed pretty soon, whether I'm still talking to you or not. So this is a a few months ago. uh, We had a request. uh, It was one of the first. uh, There are two questions on my show that I have been unable to answer. The first one I have never answered, and I actually have done a huge amount of research, and I'm like sure that I'm on a bunch of lists right now. Um, Somebody asked if a bee visits uh, plants in the Cannabaceae family, specifically THC-bearing marijuana plants, does it make a hallucinogenic honey, which would make a hallucinogenic mead? And I have done my best. I have actually called universities in an attempt to answer this question. And there isn't enough good data for me to be able to answer it. This is not the question I'm asking for help with. My question I need help with is much more quotidian. I don't do a lot of test batches anymore. Um, Smallest batch of Valkyrie's Choice I ever brewed, smallest batch of Nordic Farmhouse, uh, smallest batch of Root of All Evil, uh, we're all 1,000 gallons. I'm still a home brewer on the side. I brew a lot of beer, a lot of cider. Somebody asked a bunch of questions about brewing with fresh fruit versus dry fruit. I don't have the time or, let's be honest, inclination at this point to do dried apricots in one batch and pureed apricots in another or fresh cranberry juice and dried cranberries. And as the holidays have approached... I've gotten a whole bunch of questions because of Nordic Farmhouse. Nordic Farmhouse uses a concentrate, um, which I like for a variety of reasons, which we will definitely not have time for in this episode. We can talk concentrates versus fresh juice in another episode if you'd like. But a lot of people use craisins. You know, they go to the local store, they throw craisins in the secondary, and they make a mead that they love. So... I had sort of put this call out to my viewers on Ask the Mead Maker uh, to send me information about dried fruit, purees, fresh fruits of the same fruit in a batch of mead. And it sounds like you guys like to do side-by-sides and group experiments, and I would love if you guys could do, and I don't care what fruit it is, you know, anything but grapes, um, because raisins change too much when you try to do dried raisins or, but anything but, but grapes and raisins, I'd love to hear what you guys have from, you know, do you like craisins more than cranberry juice kind of thing? Okay. Okay. I think uh, I'll do we, one. I've got a I've got a good one. I'll do one with black currants because I've got fresh I, and dried. There you go. That's awesome. I almost uh, I almost bought a hundred dollars worth of lingonberry today 
because I was on an Ikea. And uh, <laughs> thank God Kelly and my best friend were with me. And they were like, Ricky, get, call Larry. Larry could get you Lingonberries cheaper than an <laughs> Ikea. And I'm like, I'm not sure you can get anything cheaper. I told JD, I don't know if it ended up on the air, but uh, the reason I was late to call in was I was in an Ikea today, and something that's a little wild to most people in America is that where I live, it's way faster to go to Canada to shop than to the next large city in America. <laughs> so I was in an Ikea for four hours in Montreal today. Oh, boy. Yep. I bought one bookcase wow. and ogled a lot of lingonberries. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Well, hey, uh, we need to wrap this segment up, guys. Ricky, you holy cow, wrap dude. this thing up. I need to go to bed. You know what? We got to have thing. you back on. Don't let me uh, leave yet. Uh, we got to have wait, you back wait a minute, on. Ricky. Wait right. a minute. I got this one important. question. I have one. You can have a question, but I have to tell you the last thing. The last thing. The deal. There's only the last thing. There's only one thing I can do as a professional mead maker that I disrecommend at home. One of the reasons our fermentation is so fast. It's because I pressure oxygenate. So I looked up what the toxic, the toxic oxygen density for yeast is, and That's I hard. pressurized just a fraction of an atmosphere below that. Okay. You cannot over aerate your meat. Beer. A splash back and forth on the way into the bucket. If you want to invest in one thing to improve your mead making, get an oxygen stone. Ah, I have one. <laughs> Good. Good boy. Good. That's the one thing. So I can pressurize it. The reason I don't want you pressure oxygenating at home is when you pressure oxygenate in your home, like in my meat hall, when we off-gas our tank, I, it's a 3,000-square-foot space with a 24-foot ceiling, and there's no big deal. When you off-gas, that oxygen-leaving solution at that rate turns <laughs> it's like a bomb. flammable cooking yeah. oil into explosive cooking oil and explosive natural gas into, I hope you have really good life insurance natural yeah. gas well but just bubbling through pure o2 is the if you want an upgrade other than kegging kegging is a dream everyone should have a home kegerator oxygenation is the biggest thing you can do other than upping your yeast upping your nutrient so i want to make that clear now there's a question for me yeah, I've uh, got to ask this because uh, uh, I want you to give us just a really brief, fast rundown of the root of all evil because my wife threatened me. She said if I didn't find out how to make that, she was going to stay with me for the rest of my life. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, wait. Christ. Is that Mississippi? I know that, Joe. It's hard to yeah. tell your accents over the phone. Okay. I know it's root of all evil, but... Yeah. We're getting there. So, root of all evil, we, I let Eric, who originally helped develop the recipe, run through a whole bunch of experiments. We ground ginger at home until I thought my eyes were going to bleed. And we got a commercial processor from another producer who chopped it up for us, and we did it by hand, which is the stupidest thing I've done. And we tried granulated, and we tried powdered, and we tried ground, and we tried... So, if you want to replicate it at home, and I, I actually can't do the conversion in my head, but I will tell you what we do. It is roughly 25 pounds of, I think, I'm trying to remember, I think it's technically called freeze granulated. So basically, it's a freeze-dried whole ginger 
powdered, which you can get. 25 pounds and, I don't know, two and a half gallons of fresh lemon juice per 1,000-gallon batch. We ferment it to 9% alcohol, add those ingredients so that we get an extraction at a higher ABV, then we add water to bring it to 6.9%. And it's uh, so 9% wild sour honey and with then, then D47. Dilute. 9% yep. then uh, You can actually, if you are using D47 at home, we wouldn't do this for logistical reasons at our meat hall, but you could do it at 11 or 12% and dilute, and you'd get a better extraction initially on that ginger. The whole thing's fermented at 82 degrees Fahrenheit. Wow. During active wow. fermentation. So you just but, saved my But you life. have to have a way to degas. Okay, yeah. If you okay. have to wine whip that thing or CO2 purge it or something, or else you're going to end up something that smells like a bunch of <laughs> Packers fans' farts. Uh, the uh, 25 pounds of uh, granulated ginger, that's per 1,000 gallons, right, also? Per 1,000 gallons. Don't try to fit okay. that into a carboy. Yeah. <laughs> we'll break it down. Um, yep. Yep. Uh, can I throw out one final question? Yeah, person? everything we submit to the federal government, we do by 1,000 gallons. So. Yeah. Jeff, go ahead, man. Uh Hey, I w- I kind of binge watched your shows the other day in, in preparation for your, uh, your. You know when you appearance. drink while you watch them, it's literally binge watching. <laughs> no, Sorry, go ahead. I was at work, and it, that probably would make work a lot more palatable. But the drinking and the the binge watching mm-hmm. has to happen separately. Um, mm-hmm. So anyway, mm-hmm. the the question I had, and this was this has been a, a source of consternation and a, a kind of a group experiment. But I know at one point you mentioned having a coffee. Meeting. How did that turn out? What was your approach to it? And can you tell us a little bit about that? Coffee meat? Yeah. Coffee meat, yep. That's going to have to wait for another episode. (laughs) And the reason (laughs) I have to wait for another episode is, I I will happily tell you all about it. But, um, so I get a lot of requests for special meats. I will tell you the most common request I've had um, one time. This is kind of like really stupid of me. I made a grapefruit meat for the meat hall. Um, you could only get it there. I made it, I don't know, like 15 gallons of it, you know, something like a, a negligible amount. Um, but someone put it on untapped. And for a while, it was our most highly reviewed product. And then, and this is like... That, I used to make a lot of specialty batches. I don't really have time for that anymore, but our best account requested uh, bespoke mead for an event recently, and I was like, oh, I'll make grapefruit mead. They sold five gallons of it in slightly less than two hours, and they had four other meads on tap which they also sold out of. Like, it was that popular. And the problem is I have had more requests for a re-release of my coffee mead than I have had for even the grapefruit mead. So I promised one of my accounts that I'm going to re-release somewhere in February a coffee mead and what I want to tell you guys is what I actually release to the public and not what I can barely resurrect from making a Cafe ML three and a half years ago. So, good excuse to have, to have modicum of patience. Yeah. Well, you make sure you can a few of those. Send them our way. Definitely, yeah, definitely got to have Ricky back on the show. I mean, this, this is unbelievable. Uh, you know, and I, I love your your YouTube videos. I haven't watched them all yet, but <laughs> you shouldn't. It's bad for you. 
Oh, no, come on. I mean, when I first turned it on, I see this guy sitting out in like the middle of nowhere in this green pasture in this chair with a glass oh. full of God knows what. I'm thinking, okay, what what is this uh-huh. guy doing? God knows what. <laughs> you know? Wait, oh, I have to tell you Good a true stuff. story. So, so the We're longest you project up, right? that I've ever... Oh, I not, know you are. My poor not my wife fault is sitting in the other room. <laughs> I know. I have to. I I still have bread to bake tonight. Anyway, oh. <laughs> um, do you know I also own a bakery. Anyway, oh, wow. um, yeah, it's called yeah, it's called Medjusel Bakery, which is just Old English for Mead Hall Bakery. Very clever. <laughs> anyway, um, the longest project I have ever worked on and then forgotten about in a crucial moment is uh. Through UC Davis's Wild Pollinator Health Program, my wife and I uh, built a one and a half acre wild pollinator uh, field. Basically, um, it's it, it was like six to ten hours of work every single week, starting in May, and it's called Bombegard. And we were supposed to do, like, a whole Ask the Mead Maker about it. And um, we were supposed to submit all this information to UC Davis. And a whole bunch of newspapers wanted to see how our program worked. And all I remembered to do was set out a lawn chair in one episode of Ask the Mead Maker. And be like, I'm sitting in Bondegard. And then I never talked about this wild pollinator health project that I had spent, no joke, 180 hours on. <laughs> so, you know, lots of irons right. and lots of fires. Well, uh... Anyway, I will let you guys rock. Anything else before I let you wrap up your show? No, you know what? Uh, you've left uh, plenty for a second go around with you. We'd love to have you on again. I'll have uh, Ryan get in well, touch with you. Know with where to you. find me? And absolutely, uh, we're going to put Ryan in charge of that and uh, see if we can't get you on the calendar again for future shows. Unbelievable, dude, Ricky! <laughs> thanks do. a million. Ricky, thank, thank you, you so guys. much. I really... And. Uh... Maybe next time I'll send you some of those honey wines I was talking about. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I could do with a case of this sizer. Just amazing stuff. Again, hey, get Ricky, in, get in touch with now. us about, night, the, uh, about the little experiment. Yeah. We'll get that rocking. Well, we will. You guys yeah. send me emails. You bet. We'll do. do. Thank you, Ricky. Thank you, guys. Good night. Good night. Wow. <laughs> What a show. Oh, my God. If this wasn't an entertaining night, I don't know what is. Uh, <laughs> I just I feel like my mind is blown. Everything I, I have thought about mead making. <laughs> Dude, uh, I, I'm going to say right? it again. I'm going to say it again. How long have I been talking about dry craft meads? Well, yeah. not that I can make them myself, but that's what it tastes like when someone who can make them makes them. <laughs> I can't believe yeah, but Chris. Let's, let's keep it. Let's keep it in perspective, though. Uh, we're talking about an entirely different style, so it's not yeah. like uh, everything that we do is irrelevant uh, because what we've talked about is an entirely different style of mead making. So uh, obviously, different rules apply for different styles. True. Yeah. Absolutely. These, this, yeah. yeah. This is very much a, a more than one way to skin a cat kind of approach. Yeah. Well, I'm surprised, um, and this is the second, I mean, granted, this is the sizer that I'm drinking tonight, and this stuff is just, I mean, Chris, it's just, this is like that Magners I found. I mean, this is this is like the perfect, this is what I'm looking for. This is, this is what I want to drink. Uh, yeah, and I just cracked open the farmhouse uh, cranberry, and uh, it's the... Uh, it's funky. I believe he said this was a wild fermentation. He did. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's it's very funky, and I like it. It's it's not. Uh, oh, what am I getting here? Let's see. I'm trying to look past the cranberries. I mean, it's cranberries and honey all the way. Yeah. Really. I mean, it's just. 
the the honey's really coming through. Uh, I think this one and the fire drake had the most honey character of all of them so far. Yeah. I was surprised to hear him say that there's only 10% apple in this sizer, though. But I definitely get the apple. Uh, it's oh, not. Yeah. I mean, it's not. It's not a whole lot, but it's there, and that's just how that Magners is to me. Uh, you can tell that there's an apple there somewhere, and uh, I don't get a whole lot of vanilla. But perhaps that's that. You know, if you take it out, uh, that would be that missing component that uh, uh, you know that he talks about. Uh, you know, you, you you don't notice it while it's in there, but you take it out, and you will notice it. Um, and perhaps that's what I'm looking for vanilla to do because I've, I've thrown vanilla in several of my projects and, you know, from one bean to lots of beans and every, anywhere in between. And all I get is vanilla, <laughs> you know? Yeah, but you put like six, you put like six tons of vanilla beans in a five gallon batch, so. Well, the vanilla, I did a vanilla batch on purpose, a uh, vanilla mead, but I've thrown vanilla in different batches just to just to create some kind of mouthfeel or something there, give it a little body or something. And lo and behold, I, I get freaking vanilla. I mean, that's like the first thing out of, out of the, uh, off the top, and, and uh, that's not what I want. I, I don't want a vanilla tasting mead. I want that vanilla bean to give it just a little bit of body. But, uh, mm-hmm. Jeff, but anyway. you, did a, you did one of your braggots in a, in a Sasson style. Is, did it, was it have this sort of funky character to it? Yeah. Uh, it, uh, to me, it felt like a different kind of funk, but it's, it's the same idea. You know, the, like he was saying, when you ferment hot, you get some different yeast phenolics and the Saison yeast is definitely known for, um, some funky, spicy stuff. I mean, I'm going to be sending you guys the uh, the results of that here, probably within the next month or two. Um, once I get a few more to, to box up, so you guys can see kind of the difference there. Um, but yeah, no, it, it's the same idea that you get the a little bit of a funk flavor, and I think mine came out more like um, I don't know if it was necessarily a black peppery kind of flavor, but it was in that in that uh, ballpark. Yeah, see, I, I really like that because now this one is not to the extreme, but I have had some beers that were that were intentionally funky, and and it's always interesting when you smell something that's almost like wet socks, but then mm-hmm. the flavor just is so rich and so good, and it just you know it's like conflicting sensory perception or something. Sure. Yeah. Well, and. Another thing that I liked about this is that I was using the basswood honey, which is just yeah, it's, a lot of people seem to have problems with finding something to use it for, and it really came out pretty perfect in this one, if I do say so myself. I mean, it it has a kind of a a slight bitterness to it that really played well with the that yeast character too. Kind of balanced. Yeah, and it can have out. a lot of acidity to it as well. Uh, That's true. Which. Which I think would go good in something like a braggot with a in the Hefeweizen style because you know to me Hefeweizens are sort of a, a sour they're they're leaning toward the sour side yeah and uh, mm-hmm. I could see that yeah but that's, you know, I that's had... a good way to, to to pick your honey based on what you're doing you you chose that because of its acidity and bitterness but. Uh, you know, and I chose the blackberry because of its inherent maltiness. So, uh, well, to to be perfectly honest with you, I chose the 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 basswood honey because I got a really good deal on it, and I made a saison. <laughs> that, that seemed like that a good helped. thing to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that works, huh? You got honey. You need to make something. Use it. Exactly. We. Um, mm-hmm. I think we started, we, we may have started talking about this graph, guys, uh, here the last time we, we I can't remember. Uh, I, can't, I can't remember if we started talking about this graph thing or not. We might have mentioned it. Uh, we must have, because I put the recipe up on the website. Uh, this is yep. something that Chris ran across. 
Uh, in fact, yeah, by God, we did because he he thought he was on to something. Come to find out that uh, you know several thousand other people have already made uh, this recipe, and uh, Chris and I. Uh, we're, we're, uh, Chris is actually on his second batch. I am just starting to, uh, I'll probably put mine together tomorrow, Chris. I didn't get a chance today, but, um, I don't know if you guys seen the recipe or had much chance to even, uh, go over it, but this is a, a cider. We're going to call it a cider. It's a hard cider. But uh, you're using uh, half a pound of crystal. No, I chose to use the 120. Uh, uh, and uh, what else? Uh, two pounds of, uh, of DME, one pound of amber, and one pound of light DME. Uh, hops, uh, right around 6% double A. I chose to use the Fuggles, the uh, U.S. Fuggles. Hops in mine, uh, but this really sounds uh, like something really good. Yeah, uh, you know I've got the first batch bottled, and the second batch is fermenting. Uh, DME, and uh, I'm, I'm some hearing somebody twice. Somewhere. Yeah, uh, yep. came out of Aaron, I think. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, but uh, you know, I tasted it. And um, when I was bottling it up, and it's 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 dry, it, and I think once this is in the bottle, once it's had time to sit for uh, three or four weeks or so, I think what we're going to have is basically a dry, a, as good of a dry cider as we can make with what we have. Honestly, that's the impression I get. Uh, there's just enough malt in there. And just enough hops to make up for what's lacking in the apples, and but the the little bit of residual sweetness you get from the malt uh, because it doesn't attenuate all the way, uh, that's just enough to knock down the aging. Because normally you make a cider with nothing but apple juice, and you got to let it sit for eight, ten, twelve months before it's good. Right. And I think I think this kind of knocks that down. And uh, the one thing that I have found so far that I corrected on the second batch was uh, to make sure that I avoided any sort of juice that has added vitamin C, because I think the tartness was just a little bit too much. Um, yeah. So on the second batch, I went with the simply apple. Uh, with and that's a, that's a, I think that's a nationwide brand, guys. If you have a Walmart, mm -hmm. uh, I believe that's a national brand, a national brand for Walmart, Simple Apple, Simply Apple. Uh, yep, but, and you, it's, but you uh, won't find it on the shelf. It's in the cooler section. Yeah, it has to be refrigerated. Back, yep, it's back with the orange juice, and uh, uh, it has nothing whatsoever added to it. So that should do away with the ascorbic acid uh, sour taste that came through in the first batch. So I made that change, and uh, I, you know I think I think that's going to be the icing on the cake. I, I think this is going to be the perfect cider. But please, uh, if you approach this, realize you're making a cider. You're not making a beer here. Uh, I saw a lot of reviews on this online where people were complaining about it, and I think that most of those people were beer brewers. And yeah. because they were putting malt and hops in, they had the impression they were making a an apple beer. Well, it's not. You're making a cider. So uh, keep that in mind when you taste it. Well, that's, and this, that's uh, just note, yeah. This, this recipe, uh, as much as we've got it on our website, it's called Graff, G-R-A-F-F. -F. You can also go to homebrewtalk.com, and that's where it's listed. That's where I got it. <clears throat> and I made every attempt to try to get a hold of this Brandon O, who uh, is the is the uh, creator of this recipe, and uh, with no, no luck at all. I can't get a hold of him at all. So I did give him credit for the recipe on our website, but... 
there, if you go to that thread uh, at Brahom Brew Talk, there's like 385 pages of discussion on this. <laughs> so, you know, I've been toying around with, with uh, you know, a recipe for this. And, uh, you know, again, I'm the guy who can't follow a pancake recipe without trying to tweak it. And and our show is is called the Meat House. Yep. So I've been working trying to work in a graph recipe where we work in some honey, and and trying to get you know some kind of combination here of the apple juice, the malt, and the honey. Yeah, yeah, and that I, sounds good too. And I think that's uh, you know I, I think it's going to go really well. And if it doesn't, you guys will all get bottles of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what you guys are it? all going to get bottles of this whether you like it or not what so, you, what you? <laughs> uh, i'm kind of like jeff though it's going to be a couple of months because uh yeah uh, i want to i want to give time to uh you know i don't want you to have to get it and sit on it for two or three months so yeah well and uh, mm. you know the other thing too uh uh, Chris, that you you also added. Uh, now this is this is after you did your first recipe. You put a second one together, and you added some uh, some black tea, right? I added four bags of black tea uh, while I was steeping the grains, yeah. and, and this is unflavored. Of, unflavored, just something, just plain black tea uh like irish breakfast tea or something i added four bags in the steeping water and um and i added two cans of apple juice concentrate uh just to up the apple flavor now i told you yesterday when we talked i may be premature in doing that because i tasted this when i bottled it uh the first batch i should say was to the letter by the recipe i changed nothing yeah. Uh, but when I bottled it, I noticed that the apple flavor was lacking just a little, and it was just a tad bit watery. So I added, in the second batch, I added um, two cans of apple juice concentrate and um, four black tea bags in the steep, and uh, just to try and, and correct that. Now, with that said, once that first batch sits and carbonates and does its thing for a while it may be perfect those yeah. those changes i made in the second batch may be totally unnecessary uh, True. but we'll have them and we'll have them to compare and we'll see what we like best yeah yeah well and uh i do like the idea of uh you know, I think if I were to do this again, Ryan, I think I would try to incorporate honey somehow. Uh, that sounds like an interesting combination uh, as well. Yeah, I think it'll. I think it'll add a little bit of complexity, and and yeah. I hope it does turn out. Would you now? Would you because this thing uses uh, DME? Would you? Add honey to it, or would you take a pound of DMA out and substitute, or uh, how would you approach that? I'm not taking anything out right now. Uh, I, I think I'm just going to add. No, I haven't made it yet, so I'm going to start with that. But, um, you know, I wasn't necessarily going to take anything out. I was just going to add uh, some honey to it. I think that if you did like the. Um, if you did like the uh, ABV you were going to get out of it, you know, you could try to subtract some apple juice and some DME um, and replace that with honey. But I'm just going to, I'm just going to add honey on top of it. And, and I'm trying to figure out here, should it be uh, right now? I'm going with, with, uh, with, with somewhere between one and two pounds of honey. I think is what I'm just going to add. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I think if you keep it below 10%, you can probably still keep the uh, quick drinking time. Once you get above 10%, then you're looking at aging for a while. 
Yeah. And with that being said, I think that what you'd have to do if you wanted to do that, I think you'd have to pull off one pound of DME and add a, and add your one pound of honey to try to keep the fermentables about the same. Right. Yeah. That's what I did. Uh, I took, um, I think it was Michael Fairbrother's uh, recommendation and uh, pulled two pounds of uh, 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 extract out of my that one braggot that I've got going and replaced it with two pounds of honey. So uh, just to keep everything kind of, an, of an, on an even keel. So um, they're both still on carboy, so uh, both are tasting pretty good. Uh, I may get around to racking one or both into, well, I take that back. I can only do one because I've only got one empty five-gallon keg. Uh, but one of them may get racked into a uh, into a keg here, uh, uh, you know, this week. But um, other than that, guys, uh, I guess we better wrap it up. What a hell of a show, I'll tell you. Uh, we got to have Ricky back on. He's a kick. And to our audience, if you haven't seen, uh, if you haven't seen uh, Ricky's YouTube, just go to YouTube and just type in the search bar "Ricky the Mead Maker." Uh, it'll definitely pop up. This guy's a who, and uh, you know, my, my first uh, encounter. I mean, he's sitting out in this pasture. Uh, you know, looks like he's a hundred miles from nowhere. Uh, and, uh, he's got this glass of, uh, God knows what, and he just starts in and what, I mean, I, I couldn't pull myself away from it. So, uh, it's one of those things that just, you know, keeps, keeps you, keeps you, you know, wanting more. So, uh, check it out on the YouTube, uh, Ricky, the meat maker, if you haven't seen it yet, but, uh, uh, all right, guys. Well, Hey, uh, that's going to wrap it for this uh, this week. Uh, we've got a short month coming up. We've got Christmas coming up here in a couple, uh, what is it, like three or four weeks? I mean, Christmas. I'm crying out loud. Uh, does anybody even have our broadcast calendar? I, I, no I lost track a long time ago. <laughs> but hey, JD, uh, I, I need to tell I need to tell everybody this. Uh, again. I know there's there's a fella over in Japan um, who's been listening, and um, he's emailed me a couple times wanting to know about the uh, Heart Murmur project. Oh, okay. so so I thought that we would, uh, whenever our last show is uh, before we take off for the holidays. Uh, as my holiday gift to everyone, I'm going to finally, after all this time, release my heart murmur recipe. So that'll Good. be my holiday gift to everybody. And uh, there you I, go. I guess I need to get you guys a, a bottle of it. So There you go. Uh, <laughs> Sounds there good. Go. I do have our schedule up here. We are going to be on next week, uh, December 6th, next, and the week after that, December 13th. And then we're going to take two weeks off. We're going to be off the week of the 20th, or, or the, uh, or Tuesday the 20th and Tuesday the 27th. And come and get, coming at you fresh in 2017 on January 3rd. January 3rd. There you go. Okay, perfect. Um, I gotta, I gotta start delegating some responsibility too. I keep, I, I just, I, I've got this kegerator project that I've been working on, a brand new build, and I just didn't have time to do the Facebook thing. So I'm gonna task one of you guys uh, to go out and cruise the Mead Facebook, come up with some, some good stuff from folks out there, and uh, just uh, shoot me an email, tell me who you got. And uh, I'm going to let you talk about them when we get on the air. Guys, you know, people love to hear their names uh, mentioned on the show. Our Facebook has taken off. The website's taken off. We're, we're way over several hundred downloads per show. Uh, we're up to several thousand downloads already or more. Uh, and I believe this is show number 30 tonight. So been a hell of a ride for sure but uh, tell you what come on back next week we'll do it all over again and uh i'm sure we'll have uh, plenty to talk about then so uh with that we'll see everybody next week <laughs>